Daybreak Health, our mission is to create equitable access to high quality mental health care for young people. This is a super personal mission for me. Um, I founder and CEO at Daybreak and my younger brother uh, ended up in the emergency room at the age of 21 after nine years of untreated uh, depression. And, um, you know, Daybreak exists to help the 25 million families that are going through similar things like uh, what my family did uh, get access to care sooner. So super excited to be here and talk a little bit about that. Um, just in terms of our leadership team, um, you know, I'm complimented by deep expertise on both the clinical operations, but also deep expertise in the managed care side with Dr. Eden Schaefer, who is the CMO at MHN, um, as well as deep expertise in the child and adolescent mental health space uh, with Allison Knight, uh, who's a licensed clinical psychologist, um, did her training at UCSF and has spent uh, the majority of her career building and, um, and deploying Medicaid-based um, behavioral health programs. So uh, we've got a phenomenal leadership team that's really focused on solving the, the problem at hand here. What I wanted to do today is just talk to you about what, um, what does Daybreak mean by a comprehensive mental health system designed for youth? Um, and I will walk you through each of these things sequentially. Um, you know, the first thing is we focused purely on child and adolescent mental health. That is all we do. And we go both deep and broad across a range of conditions. Um, with specialized treatment programs. And I'll talk to you a little bit about each of those. Um, we also provide a comprehensive suite of not only treatment, but also um, screening and preventative services. And um, in our treatment model, it's both a virtual model. So the primary way we deliver care is, uh, is virtually through teletherapy, but we also provide blended services. Um, and we do that in partnership um, with schools. And so we do provide some services on site. Um, as well as teletherapy and really work closely with schools um, to drive access through identification tools to uh, prevention as well. Um, and then ultimately getting kids into care if they need it. So last thing I'll walk you through is how it all comes together in terms of the outcomes, um, which we measure across the adolescents, the schools, as well as the families. So let's dive in. Um, population specialization, like I said, um, we're purely behavioral health, purely children and adolescents. And when you think about the range of conditions that we're working on, um, anxiety and depression, I, you know, that's obviously the core um, right now when you look at the estimates of anywhere between one and four and one and three kids struggling with a depression or anxiety, particularly post pandemic. But we've also developed programs that uh, can treat a broad range of conditions. And what we've been seeing, particularly with adolescents right now, is an increase in needs around identity um, and sexual um, development. So LGBTQ+, uh, we've been seeing a lot of trauma, particularly coming out of the pandemic, and we've developed a trauma-focused program. We can also treat things like ADHD, anger management, um, and then we can support autism, eating disorders, and substance abuse. So those, those aren't our primary um, focus areas. So those are a little bit about the, um, the types of uh, mental health conditions we can work with and we feel very confident in treating. And we do that across the age spectrum from ages uh, 6 to 19. I want to talk a little bit about, um, I'll, I'll deep dive into the treatment model in just a second, but before I do that, what does it mean to kind of provide this system of care? What does that comprehensive suite of preventative and outpatient programs mean to us? It's really four things. Um, so identification, prevention, treatment, and coordination. So again, we're, we're super specialized in mental health and, and what that does is allows us to provide a broad range of services that all work together um, to provide access to care to kids. So on the identification side, we have a range of digital mental health screeners that we've built. Um, we've deployed these at tens of thousands of, uh, of kids and we do that in partnership with the school districts, which I'll tell you about in just a second. That helps us get the first and earliest beat on um, what are the needs that the kids have um, what's the level of need they have so we can get them into the right level of treatment. Um, and then also what's the specific need they have so we can get them um, to the right pocket of, of providers or, or interventions. Um, the next kind of thing we do is prevention. So we do a lot of mental health education. And again, this is in partnership with the schools that we work with. Um, we do classes and we do groups for families and youth. That's that level of care. Um, we find that not every kid needs to go straight to therapy um, or medication support. Uh, it's not it's not super cost effective and it's not also the right answer. So um, we, we provide a broad range of preventatives and partnerships with the district we work with. On the treatment side, I'll deep dive into this and just we provide both therapy programs um, as well as medication support. 
Um, and again, all of that is done through specialized licensed clinicians, LCSWs, LMFTs, um, as well as licensed um, child and adolescent psychiatrists. And then lastly, um, we also provide those coordination services. So once treatment terminates with daybreak, if there's an additional level of treatment needed, ongoing care coordination navigation through our, um, our dedicated care coordination team. Let's deep dive into the treatment model because that's where I want to spend um, probably the bulk of our time today. So um, we, we try to provide specialized and personalized treatment models for um, really the, the foremost problems facing adolescents, which are, are the ones that we're really focused on. The ones that I talked about, we're seeing a lot of trauma, a lot of um, identity development, and of course, a lot of anxiety and depression right now, um, and particularly in the culturally diverse and bottom half of the socioeconomic um, strata. So that's where we're focused right now, and this is the treatment model that we're bringing to bear. So um, on the therapy side, what we're doing is we have a range of, of programs that are designed to treat um, different sets of conditions. These programs range anywhere between eight and 20 weeks, and they're all based on evidence-based principles. Um, this isn't to say that our, program, our treatment program is out of the box. So one condition type gets one treatment program. That's not what it is at all. But we do have those, those puzzle pieces that we can fit together. We try to provide personalized uh, treatment by obviously varying, varying the treatment length and the treatment modality, but also being very thoughtful about the match between um, the young person and their clinician. We found that's the number one determinant of retention in care, which leads to outcomes in care. And I'll talk a little about how we make that match in just a second, but that is where the, the personalization of the treatment model starts and then it continues throughout. Um, some sample intervention models that we use, um, it's really all based off of uh, the core evidence, the best of the core evidence-based modalities that are out there to get today, whether it's CBT, trauma-focused CBT, EMDR, um, things like that. And we've built, again, those specialized sub-programs for the, the areas that we're seeing pop up most frequently um, in the schools and the youth that we work with, which right now are primarily around trauma, LGBTQ+. Um, we're seeing a big need around foster youth, and that's driving a lot of cost as well um, for the plans we work with right now, um, and then treatment-resistant depression. I want to talk a little bit about our personalized and culturally responsive match because, again, this is one of the things that we we uh, think drives the vast majority of our ability to retain and engage um, the patients that we work with. So you can see a little bit on the right, we're measuring um, uh, counselor preferences, um, and we do everything from the, the clinical need and the specialty, that's part of our algorithm, the clinical style, so are they giving homework or are they a little bit more laid back, the personality, um, which you can see in the top right there, the most, most kids prefer warm and bubbly, but you know some, some kids like uh, maybe me when I was a kid prefer someone who's a little bit more honest and direct. Really actually it's super important um, to, to ensuring engagement and retention. And then of course, cultural factors and demographic factors. Um, like Hazel, we pride ourselves on um, having a provider group that uh, majority identifies as BIPOC and um, that helps us meet the need with the school districts we work with. All of this is tech enabled. So we've built uh, both a mobile app as well as uh, clinician tools to ensure that the, the specific programs we've built are actually, they live and breathe through the technology. Um, and so the mobile app access uh, between sessions for youth drives retention and engagement. It's not a substitute for those live sessions, but it is a complement, and it allows uh, our youth to do progress check-ins, which also then loops back into our measurement-based care model. Um, and the clinician tools, um, which we've built to help our clinicians be more efficient and effective. So um, I won't spend too much time on this, but just know it is all enabled by tech. Um, okay, so so like Hazel, we do work with schools, and I and and Michael, I appreciate you doing a lot of the groundwork in terms of uh, a lot of the uh, the nuances of working with schools, um, and and I certainly agree with all of that. I'm gonna um, maybe just show one slide here uh, on the end-to-end -end program that we've built with schools. Um, and what I will say is that for those of you who've worked with schools, they are laser focused right now on this multi-tier system to support MTSS. It's a big buzzword. Um, the idea behind it is you need to tier your interventions because not every kid needs the same level of intervention, right? And so in, as Daybreak has developed our program, what we've done is we've tried to mirror that MTSS um, that the schools use. And then we've added an additional layer around triage. So on the right-hand side, um, what we're helping districts do through our digital screening tools 
is collect data and identify pockets of need so they can use their resources most effectively and they can get the right kids into the right level of care. We then offer interventions at each of these levels of care. So starting with tier one, we provide mental health education. Many schools refer to this as emotional education. We've built out a proprietary curriculum here. Um, we are able to serve upwards of 50% of the kids at a district in this way without having to provide them, you know, that individualized therapy, which is obviously more, um, more cost intensive. We also provide uh, drop-ins in groups. Um, we do this through our on-site presence at districts. And then, as I mentioned, um, and we just went through, we really the core of our treatment model for those, those students who do need a higher, higher level of care is virtual therapy and medication support. And we have those specialized therapy programs I talked about. We also do family therapy and then medication management and support through our child and adolescent psychiatrist. So, so again, you can see here, this is a super broad range of services, which we're able to provide because we are laser focused on adolescent mental health in the context of the school system um, and providing quality services that, that have breadth and depth. Um, we're working with uh, students in multiple states uh, covering more than half a million uh, kids so far um, across the districts we work with. So we're really excited about that. And where I wanna wrap up today is just talking a little bit about the results that we have. So um, we measure results across adolescents, families, and schools. Uh, I won't read all these quotes, but you can feel free to read them yourself. Um, we ask kids for a five-star rating, super accessible and easy, 4.6 out of five. Um, we're very proud of that. Um, we're even more proud of the fact though that 81% of youth that go through one of our evidence-based programs are seeing symptom reduction upon program completion, which is really phenomenal. And 90% uh, of youth that, uh, that we matched one of our clinicians say that we made the right match based on that clinical style and that personality type. And again, that's the driver of retention for these kids, which is really the driver of the outcomes, right? Can you get them to go through the program? And it all starts with that rapport. You know, do they like the person that they're talking to on a week over week basis? On the family side, um, a big part of our treatment model is incorporating family, whether that's with family therapy or through education. Um, nine out of 10 parents um, are reporting behavioral improvements um, at home. And, and on average, uh, parents give us a nine out of 10 satisfaction rating. So really, really strong feedback here. Um, and we're super excited that the families are seeing uh, the impact as well. And then lastly with schools, um, you know, every school is, uh, you know, when you sit down and you start working with them, they're, they don't believe that you're gonna be able to engage the kids, um, the students in, in, that they refer to you in, their ther in the therapy program. And so um, we're, able to, we're really proud to report that in partnership with schools, um, and in partnership with the school councils that make the referrals, um, we're able to get 78% of students who start one of our evidence-based treatment programs all the way through it. Um, and then school counselors, four and five of them are reporting noticeable improvements um, in the students day-to-day -day in the school setting. So that's a very, very important metric when you're talking about working closely with these schools and it's one that we're, we're very proud of. So I'll wrap all this up um, by just saying, um, we've got three ways that we work with health plans and Medicaid. Um, so fee, your standard fee-for-service reimbursement, um, schools are seeding a lot of the funding, um, especially for the identification and preventative services, but um, once you get into that individual level treatment, um, we do supplement the school's budget with, with health, uh, health plan fee-for-service reimbursement, so that's one very concrete way. Um, we've also stood up school district joint programs with health plans, um, going to school districts together. Um, with a proposal for how we can provide integrated mental health. Um, and then lastly, um, focus pilots on high cost populations. So we developed a foster youth program with an eye towards um, being able to bring down cost um, on a specific population. And so those are the things we're always hoping to do, it, not only across the behavioral health spend, but of course, obviously, then hoping to bring down the medical spend as well. So um, we're, we're confident that all these outcomes that I mentioned to you today translate into, uh, into cost reduction and we're uh, happy to put our money where our mouth is there.